Well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful to Brian for the invitation. I think we were, I was here in the Twin Cities about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, and mentioned I would be back in the area in a year, and he said, oh, you should, we should get you scheduled. So I'm glad that this worked out while I'm here. Uh, I would like to talk to you about a, a really big subject tonight. It's probably usually foolish to try to talk about a really, really, really big subject and try to do it in 40 minutes or so, but uh, I want to talk to you about wisdom. And uh, what I'll be saying tonight is, um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm taking it from a paper that I've recently written. It's not, it hasn't been published yet. I'm still working on it. I'm not going to try to relate everything that's in this paper, but I do hope that, I hope that I can provide some stimulating material for you to think about, but also I hope that in our, uh, the discussion time later that I can learn from you and hear what you have to say about what I present and I can keep working on my paper and making it better. I might begin by, uh, by putting a question to you this way. How is it that people come to be persuaded of moral truths? How do they learn practical skills, practic useful practical skills? Uh, how do they master, how do people come to master an academic discipline? Now, surely if you're thinking about those, and those are obviously, that gives you the wide range of things to think about. Surely all of those to some degree or another involve some rational, logical, orderly thinking. There are plenty of attempts that are made to offer nice rational arguments in favor of controversial moral positions. If you want to learn a practical skill, you can find pamphlets and websites that will give you in 15 or 20 steps how to do any complicated thing, learn how to do something. You can, if you want to learn an academic discipline, there are plenty of textbooks out there that cost a lot of money that will give you the basics for trying to learn and then further develop your knowledge of an academic discipline. And yet I'd suggest that simply thinking that we can learn moral truths or learn a useful practical skill or to master an ac academic discipline, it requires a lot more than simply logical, rational thinking that one might do in the quiet of one's study. So how do people come to learn these things and to gain these things? And I think a much better answer, a much fuller answer than rational, logical argument or uh, explanation is this big topic of wisdom. It is through wisdom that people come really to know moral truths. It's through wisdom that people really learn practical skills and through wisdom that people master academic disciplines. And I'd also, as we think about this tonight, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to think of those latter two things as part of the first. In other words, that the learning of useful practical skills and the mastering of academic disciplines is actually part of our larger moral calling that uh, is centered around, at least that what I'm arguing is centered around this idea of wisdom. So I would like to begin in a, my, my first opening section of this lecture uh, to talk to you about what I'm going to call the Royal Commission. And I'm not going to talk about wisdom in this opening section, but it's going to be foundational for my introduction of wisdom a little bit later. Now here I want to offer a kind of a big picture theological perspective on what God created us to do as human beings, as image bearers of God. And I think it's this, this big picture that I'm going to offer that uh, is sort of a framework for thinking then about moral truths and practical skills and academic disciplines. So I, I would like to, to introduce this topic of this royal commission by reflecting for a little bit on the idea of the image of God. Now we meet the idea of the image of God, this really, really important Christian doctrine already in the first chapter of scripture. 
Right, the very first thing scripture says about human beings, God created man in his image according to his likeness. And this is one of the great topics in the history of Christian thought. What is the image of God? And I'm not going to pretend to give you a comprehensive answer to that uh, in 30 seconds. But I would like to suggest that in Genesis 1, the thing that is highlighted, the thing that is really central for bearing the image of God is the call to rule, a call to exercise a benevolent dominion in this world. And that's, that's a significant affirmation uh, because to a lot of Christ, the history of Christian theology, theologians have tended to think of the image of God in, in terms of attributes that human beings possess, rationality, uh, volitionality, right? uh, we're moral creatures. Now I don't want to say that those things are wrong because I don't think we can understand what it means to be an image bearer of God if we don't have rationality, if we don't have wills, if we don't have moral capacity. Those things I, I think are in some ways prerequisites for the image of God. But it's interesting that in Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image. And the way the, that text continues, in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, suggests a purpose clause. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, so that he might rule. And what's communicated in the text is that this call to rule, this vocation to exercise a benevolent dominion, is not somehow peripheral to the image of God, but is in some way essential to the image of God. That that is actually a crucial part of what it is to be human. That is what God made the human race for, is to take up what I am referring to as this royal commission. And in the, the, the several verses in that part, uh, in, in, in the end of uh, Genesis 1, we find that dominion unpacked a little bit for us. God calls the human race to be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue the other creatures, and to exercise this dominion. So here in the creation story, we, have, we begin with two human beings in a particular place, and God gives this commission to multiply and to fill this broad earth, and in doing so, to exercise a certain kind of mastery in this world. Now again, I would want to emphasize it's a benevolent mastery. It's a mastery under God's ultimate lordship, and it's for the good of human beings and for the good of the rest of creation, so I'm not suggesting any sort of tyrannical rule. Uh, but this is what God gave the human race to do at the beginning. And I suggest that this is, this is essential for what it is to be human. Having the image of God, being image bearers of God is to be human, and to be an image bearer of God is to have this moral vocation, to have this royal commission. Now of course there, uh, there's a, an immediate question that arises, and that's what about the fall into sin, because as, you know, almost as soon as we're introduced to this royal commission and Adam and Eve get going, we find the story of the fall. And we may wonder, is there anything left of this royal commission after the fall? Is there some reason to think that this royal commission is still operative, is still obligatory for the human race? And I'd like to argue briefly here that it is, in fact, although somewhat modified. Uh, it is uh, modified, it is refracted in a way that's appropriate for a fallen world and taking account for the fact that this world uh, is not what it was originally made to be. And I would argue, I would like to just suggest a few things in support of that uh, from the account of the covenant with Noah in Genesis 9. Now you may remember after the account of the great flood, God enters into a covenant with the entire human race and in fact the entire created order. And in this covenant, we find evidence that this royal commission is still operative. 
Uh, in this covenant in which God promises to preserve this world, to preserve the order of this world, this natural order and the human and human society within it, God indicates that human beings still have this moral vocation, even though it comes in somewhat modified form. Now, it's interesting in this account of the covenant with Noah, God addresses human beings as his image bearers. So, what God said of human beings at the opening of Scripture in Genesis 1 is repeated. Human beings remain the image bearer of God despite the fall into sin. And we read in this covenant with Noah that human beings are still to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In fact, it says it twice in the Noahic covenant. This is still part of that call, which seems to presume in and of itself that there is some obligation uh, to be ruling and to exercising this sort of benevolent mastery in the world. We also find that human beings are called to the task of doing justice in this world. He who sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. It's an expression of this idea of, of proportionate justice. And so here's another aspect of this dominion in the world that human beings are to exercise. So it is somewhat, it, it's, a, it's modified. It's a little bit more modest than what we found in Genesis 1. There's no call to subdue. There's a little bit more, you might say, subdued tone. Uh, because of the presence of sin, and yet there is still this moral vocation held out for the human race as God's image bearers. Now, if we were to look at Genesis 9, if I was to read this, the text of this covenant, uh, you might be struck by the fact that there is actually such, so, so little there in terms of moral content. Um, there isn't much given as far as the commission that's offered to the human race. And yet, I'd like to suggest that this royal commission, even as it comes in the covenant with Noah to the human race, is in fact an exceedingly complex vocation. This royal commission is not simple, but extremely complex. Why is that? Well, if human beings are to fill the earth, to multiply and to fill the earth, and to exercise some degree of rule and mastery in this world. We might take this for granted now, but what an amazing thing that human beings, starting from scratch, have accomplished what they have even to this point. If human beings were to fill the earth and exercise some mastery over it, it certainly required some very impressive degree of technological advance. It's just even things that we may take for granted, like agriculture. Productive fields don't just grow on their own. This was something that the human race needed to develop. Uh, medicine, if human beings subject to the fall were to be fruitful and really to multiply through the earth, uh, medicine needed to be developed. And then you start thinking about things like agriculture and medicine and many other technological advances that actually enable human beings to fill the earth and to exercise some mastery in it. And that implies that we need to develop a host of practical skills and intellectual disciplines if we're to do that. And think of all the just very practical skills that human beings are not born innately able to do. They don't know how to do it as they're born from their mother's womb, and yet know how to do, have learned how to do in the course of filling this earth. And um, think about the intellectual disciplines, the academic disciplines that many of you are studying at universities. Um, human beings had to develop mathematics and engineering and natural sciences in order to develop their these technological advances. And then you start thinking about this a little bit more, and as human beings are developing these technological uh, advances and developing these practical skills and intellectual disciplines, that would seem to require a host of institutions and social structures that actually would provide the context in which these activities, these endeavors can be pursued. We need family structures in order to produce and raise children we need legal and political and economic structures in order to 
pursue these various tasks. And so as we stop and think about this, I hope you can appreciate why I say that this royal commission that human beings have, even though in some ways stated very simply in the book of Genesis, is really a very complex vocation. Now, so complex that human beings never had a blueprint for carrying out in detail. There was no detail given, certainly in natural revelation, God's revelation in the created order. There really isn't even a blueprint for it in special revelation in the scriptures. In order to accomplish this royal commission, to pursue this royal commission, the human race needed a very long process of experimentation, of construction, of refinement and improvement, sometimes just chucking out things. And even when we think about what the human race has accomplished, despite all the sin, all the wickedness of this world, to think what even the human race has accomplished to this point, we understand that by abstract, rational co contemplation, not only could no one have figured that out ahead of time from scratch, but no one is capable of actually taking in and understanding the world that we've made. No one can master entirely all the fields of learning and the practical skills and the social institutions that we have. It defies the understanding of any particular person or even groups of people. So I want to bring this opening section uh, to an end. And let me conclude this section by, um, by saying that if this, if this royal commission held out for the human race, uh, this moral vocation, is truly this complex, then surely we need much more than the memorization of rules, the memorization of principles, um, handy guides, if we are to understand something of this world and understand our place within it and understand how we can contribute to this ongoing task of the human race to exercise dominion. Now this doesn't mean, I don't mean to suggest that learning rules and principles aren't extremely helpful, aren't extremely helpful in pedagogy, in teaching things to the next generation, learning new things, but surely no set of rules or principles is ever going to somehow exhaust uh, what this royal commission is. Uh, something else is needed other than the memorization of rules and principles if we are to actually begin to understand uh, this world that God has made and our callings within it. And it's with that that I want to turn to the second section of my lecture. And here I want to come to this the main topic that I wish to reflect with you about this evening, which is wisdom. I've basically been trying to set you up for appreciating the subject of wisdom. And here's the main claim that I would like to make in the second part of my lecture. And that's wisdom, particularly as understood in the book of Proverbs, but you can find a lot of similar things in a lot of other wisdom traditions in this world. Wisdom, particularly as understood in Proverbs, is a perception or understanding of how to pursue the Royal Commission well. Wisdom is that intellectual and moral virtue or attribute that enables us to pursue this Royal Commission well. Now before I say anything more about wisdom, I just want to alert you to the fact and admit to you that I'm only, I, I, I'm only scratching the surface of this topic. There are a lot of important things about wisdom that I'm not going to discuss. A lot of things, for example, that Ecclesiastes and Job wrestle with. Some of the things that are actually present in Proverbs as well. I'm not going to pursue right now the very important New Testament theme that Christ is the ultimate expression of God's wisdom and the idea that Paul uh, unpacks, especially in 1 Corinthians, that in the cross of Christ, you know, paradoxically, unexpectedly, we see the wisdom of God so wonderfully 
expressed. I'd be happy to talk with you about that in our question and answer time later. Uh, but I am going to focus on particular aspects of wisdom that relate, I think, especially to this royal commission as uh, given in the opening of Genesis and renewed in modified form in the covenant with Noah. So having severely qualified the scope of what I'm talking about, let me uh, turn to wisdom and uh, try to help you understand at least some important aspects of this important subject. I want to begin by suggesting a couple things that wisdom is not. Sometimes in order to understand what something is, it's helpful to understand what it's not. And one thing that wisdom is not is the memorization of rules. I think probably just about everybody who's thought about wisdom realizes that there's a big difference between someone who's wise and someone who has sat down with a book and is able to learn how to recite three or 10 or 50 or 500 moral rules. Simply having a lot of rules in one's head is not the same as being wise. And that's really evident as we read the book of Proverbs. There are some things in Proverbs that do sound like rules, uh, but so many of the, 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 the Proverbs that we find in the book of Proverbs are certainly can't be understood strictly as rules. So if you take, for example, Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Is that a rule? Well, it doesn't really quite work as a rule, uh, because we understand that it's not, it's not always true. Right? It, 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 it tells us how things ordinarily work, but it doesn't tell us how things always work. We know that there are some parents who diligently train their children in the ways of the Lord, and those children depart from that way. So that's something other than a rule, the way we would think of uh, a rule ordinarily. Or you might think, for example, of Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, uh, in which in consecutive Proverbs, one says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, and then the very next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly. And if you're thinking in terms of rules, that becomes very difficult because they tell us to do opposite things. And we understand that in order to actually get what Proverbs is instructing us there, you have to think of it in some other way other than just memorizing rules. It's helping us to see something that can't simply be reduced to that. All right, so here's a second thing that wisdom is not. <laughs> I like to suggest that wisdom is not the application of rules to particular circumstances. And I think this claim is not going to be as obvious to everybody. In fact, a lot of people think of wisdom in this way. A lot of people, I believe, think of wisdom as you, know, you, you have some clear rules. Right? You have some things we know we ought to do. But you get situations in life that kind of, kind of within the gaps. There's no rule that clearly dictates what we're to do in that situation. And so what does wisdom do according to this common way of thinking? Well, wisdom kind of fills in the gaps. Wisdom applies the rules to these kind of difficult, concrete circumstances. Well, certainly wisdom one of the things wisdom does is helps us to know how to act in difficult circumstances. But I don't think this way of thinking of wisdom as a gap filler, or simply as the application of clear rules to unclear circumstances, I don't think that's sufficient. And just to give one example from the book of Proverbs as to why I don't think that works. You may, if, you, if you're familiar with the book of Proverbs, I think I saw Bible over there, open to Proverbs. I don't know if that's like your theme book, or, but you, know, you, you can do worse at a Christian study center. Um, uh, in, in the opening, in, in, in the, the, the prologue of the book of Proverbs, which is the first nine chapters, it's a very uh, extended prologue, one of the important themes there is warning a young man against adultery, against the adulterous woman. Now, when you think about adultery, 
Adultery is one of the actually very clear moral rules. Right? It's not, if, if, if you're thinking of adultery in terms of really difficult, hard, hard moral situation, you're probably not in very good shape morally. Adultery is one of those clear rules. And yet, <laughs> recognizing that and avoiding adultery is a great mark of wisdom. If that's, if that's the case, then we surely can't reduce wisdom to a kind of a gap filling. There's something about even understanding clear rules and avoiding what that prohibits that exemplifies wisdom. So wisdom can't be reduced to application or gap filling, I suggest. So what is wisdom? Those things are not what wisdom is. What is wisdom? I suggest that wisdom is a moral power, you might say a moral virtue, that some people possess by which they understand what courses of conduct are good and bad and are able to put this knowledge into appropriate practice. Or to put it uh, another way, getting at the same idea. Wisdom is a perception or a sense of how the world works and thus of what sort of conduct is likely to be effective or destructive in particular circumstances. Wisdom is that which grasps what behavior is fitting in particular circumstances, particularly in light of the effects it has, the effects it has on the person who's acting, but also upon the other people uh, who are affected by that action in the various communities in which that person lives. This is one of the reasons why Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, it proceeds in large part by helping readers recognizing recurring patterns. Recurring patterns of what happens in this world. Patterns of how certain character traits tend to produce certain sorts of actions. Patterns of how certain sorts of actions tend to produce certain sorts of results, tend to reap certain kinds of fruits. Proverbs multiplies analogies. You read Proverbs, it's constantly saying this is like that, X is like Y. It's helping us to understand the world in its many interconnections and the patterns that are operative in this world that we need to understand and need to grasp if we're to act effectively and fruitfully in this world. To put it in yet another way, Proverbs instills a way of seeing the world. It's a way of seeing. It is a, I think Proverbs instills a kind of connoisseur's taste for apt speech and behavior. You know how a connoisseur of something just sort of has this, this, this instinct, this sense, this perception of what's good, of what makes for something good in that field in which the person has this connoisseurship. Now, wisdom is not simply this perception or this sense that I've just described. I would also suggest that wisdom consists in skillful action in putting this perception into practice. It's more, in other words, it's more than just having this sense, having this connoisseur's taste for appropriate speech, appropriate behavior. And also, wisdom is also the kind of skillful action to put your perception into practice. It's interesting that the, the word for wisdom, hokmah, which is used uh, throughout Proverbs and elsewhere in scripture, uh, it often describes uh, craftsmen, craftsmen who build a house. Right? That is an expression of wisdom. It describes uh, uh, kings and uh, uh, rulers, those who rule justly. Uh, that is, that it's wisdom to be able to govern justly. Actually, this word is described of God. God is wise. In particular, Proverbs 3 and 8, it describes God in his work of creation. As God ordered this world, it was the display of his wisdom. 
And so wisdom is this sort of craftsmanship to be able to effectively carry out good things in this world. In Proverbs, the wise man is industrious. Think about how often in the book of Proverbs, laziness or uh, a sloth, the sluggard, uh, is, is ridiculed. And how industrious, hard, diligent work uh, is praised. The wise person in Proverbs has this way of bringing order out of chaos. The farmer, the wise farmer, is able to bring out a good crop from fallow ground. The wise parent is able to take an unruly, immature child and to, uh, to put that child on the straight path. The wise king is able to, to bring justice uh, out of chaos in society. Um, I would suggest here, I, it's probably not, uh, not a lot of time to, uh, to explore this as I might. Perhaps some of you are familiar with uh, the great philosopher of science of the 20th century, Michael Polanyi, who was, uh, wrote one of his great books was called Personal Knowledge. And he suggests in that book, uh, it's a book I recommend your consideration, that'd be a good book to read as a study center at some point, um, that, that he, he says this, um, the aim of a skillful performance is achieved by the observance of a set of rules which are not known as such to the person following them. And what he's saying, and he actually uses the examples of poetry and golf. I'm not much into poetry, but I like golf, so I really like this analogy that he uses. But what he's getting at, he says that, you know, there, there are certain rules and maxims for what makes for good poetry. And there are certain rules and maxims for, you know, uh, how you play golf effectively, what makes for a good golf swing. Uh, but if you actually would find a very accomplished golfer or a very accomplished poet, that person doesn't, isn't necessarily able to, act, to explain in detail actually what those rules and maxims are. And even if that person actually knows the rules and maxims, it's not as if they're thinking about them while they're carrying out their, their art. It's not as if the poet writing a beautiful piece of poetry is thinking about his 10th grade poetry textbook. They're not as if the accomplished golfer on the 18th hole at Augusta National is, is thinking about the, uh, the swing tips you find in your introductory golf book from the public library. People who are carrying out these skills have a kind of a, this personal knowledge that can't be reduced to simply knowing a bunch of rules and principles, but there is this, this personal knowledge, this kind of uh, this sense and perception of what makes for good performance of a skill or of an, uh, of an art. And so in summary, I'd like to suggest that wisdom is not in essence a knowledge of rules or of how to apply such rules, but a perception of how the world works and what sort of, and what sort of conduct is therefore effective and fitting. A perception that resides not only in the intellect, but also in practical skills that enable execution of difficult but profitable activities. And given this, I, I hope that you can begin to see why I would suggest that wisdom is the appropriate moral and intellectual faculty for understanding and practicing the Royal Commission. I suggested earlier that this great moral vocation, which I call the Royal Commission, can't be reduced to a bunch of rules, to a set of rules that somehow describe all that is required for the human race to fulfill its great calling from God. Um, wisdom, likewise, not a perception, not a memorization of rules, but a perception of a larger order and an understanding of how this world works and how to accomplish good things within it. So I suggest that wisdom is the suitable way to apprehend subjectively what the Royal Commission prescribes objectively. And that brings me to my third uh, and final point this evening. And uh, that is, uh, well, I want to reflect on how is it that we actually grow in wisdom? Because that really would be the final piece of 
this puzzle that I'm trying to set before you briefly this evening. Uh, if, uh, if maturing in wisdom, all right, uh, growing in wisdom is the way that we undertake to fulfill the Royal Commission, then we need to know how, we, how it is we grow in wisdom. Um, so I'd like to suggest, again, this is going to be a lot briefer than I, it'd be fun to talk about this more. I want to suggest that growing in wisdom is, is very much a communal process. That's what I'd like to, to focus upon here with you. And both of those words are important. Wis the growing in wisdom is communal in that it requires the participation in communities. And it also, I would say, wisdom resides in communities. Right? There is a certain wisdom that, uh, that good, healthy, prosperous societies uh, possess. But it's also a process. Wisdom is not gained overnight. Wisdom is the task of a lifetime. Uh, it's dearly acquired. Uh, so let's think about this. I want to think about this with you first on an individual level. On an individual level, this is certainly according to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, we can only gain wisdom if we are willing to learn from others. It's clear in Proverbs that this process of learning wisdom begins at, in, in youth. It's supposed to begin in youth. Proverbs makes a very big deal about parents training their children, about children heeding their parents. But it's clear that as a person grows, as a person ages, there is, we don't become those who cease to learn from others, but actually our circle of those from whom we learn is to grow. So we actually, in some ways, we become, it's all the more important that we learn. We, we learn from more people as we grow. Proverbs makes a very big deal of how important it is to take advice, to heed correction. I'll tell you, there are a couple of things that I have just, in the course of my life, uh, in the last week and a half, I have been drawn into a couple of circumstances. They were not my problems, at least not directly, but I was drawn into these problems that other people had with, e <laughs> with people. And I cannot even begin to tell you how it struck me in these circumstances, how important it is to be humble and to be willing to take correction. And that when people are not willing to heed others' advice, um, the process of growing in wisdom and of good relations among people is, can be so severely hindered. It's not just that we ought to be willing to take advice when people give it, but we should be soliciting advice from people. Uh, Proverbs also encourages us to have many counselors and to, uh, to seek wise people, to seek older people uh, from whom we can learn. But it's also interesting in Proverbs and very important that we are to engage in a kind of a self-education as well. Even as we are constantly trying to learn from others and, and to absorb wisdom from those around us, Proverbs also calls us to engage in this ongoing process of, of observation and reflection and drawing conclusions from what we have observed and uh, reflected upon. And there's some great examples in Proverbs. Some of the most memorable uh, parts of Proverbs, I think, are, are, are examples of this. Uh, one is that the, the, the very uh, simple uh, uh, text in Proverbs 6, which says, go to the ant and be wise. There's this, I, there's this observation, looking at how ants conduct themselves. There's reflection. Huh, these ants, they don't have a king, they don't have a leader, and yet look at the work that they do. And, they provide food for themselves, and there's conclusion that's drawn. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands at rest, poverty will come upon you like a bandit. <laughs> and they get that same kind of uh, uh, reasoning later in um, uh, Proverbs chapter 24. I, th I think this, this one's better than the, the end, I think. You have this, you know, the, the, the author of Proverbs is walking along, and he sees the field of the sluggard. 
and what's going on in the field of the sluggard. Are there weeds growing up, the fences falling down. And he says, it actually says, you know, I, I stopped and I thought. And what does he conclude? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands of rest. So you, there, you see these examples in which Proverbs is telling us it's not just that you're learning you know, from others by getting advice from others, but you're actually alert to the world around you. And you are seeking to take in what you see and to, uh, to process that and to incorporate that into what you have been learning, including what you've been learning from others. Even what you, even what you learn anew, even what you discover for yourself, you really only learn it as you relate it to what you already know. And this is part of the power of the analogies of Proverbs. The learning of new things by the comparison to things that are already familiar to us. And I think these things are true. I am not have time to explore that right now, but I think these things are true at a social level as well. Human societies, both I think at very small levels, various sorts of human communities and larger political communities, have a sort of, uh, a, a certain social capital that have, that's have been gained only over long periods of time uh, by the experimentation and the learning and the long process of refinement of those, even over many generations, uh, who have participated in these communities. And include scholarly communities. So I would suggest that people mature in wisdom and come to understand the Royal Commission through a social process, beginning in youth and continuing throughout life, in which they receive and solicit instruction and combine the knowledge thus acquired with enriched and refined insights gained through their own observations, reflections, and conclusions, all of which instill a perception of how the world works and therefore what sort of conduct is fitting within it. Now, I do wonder if this may strike some people immediately as being too idealized. That this, maybe this just sounds all a little bit too neat and, and good to actually reflect real life. But personally, I'm actually more concerned that this is too pessimistic. Because in a real way, if this is actually the way that wisdom is acquired, this is the way we come to understand how we fulfill our moral vocation from God, this royal commission, then we realize just how dependent we are upon the communities in which we participate. If, if what I've said is correct, then to be born to foolish parents is an enormous hindrance and obstacle in life. And I guess we kind of all know that that's true, apart from any fault on the person who's born to foolish parents. If we don't participate in healthy, wise communities, either on small levels or in large levels, we are severely hindered in our ability to learn how the world works, how to grow in wisdom, and how to carry out, how to participate in this royal commission that God has given to us. It's not as if people can't overcome hindered, poor up upbringings, just as it's very possible for people with good upbringings to squander the advantages they have. But it's certainly, uh, we certainly must come to appreciate just how incredibly dependent we are upon the social context in which we have and continue to participate. So I guess just in conclusion, let me just mention a few, just a, a couple things very briefly, and then I'd be delighted to hear your comments and your questions. First of all, just to reflect on the um, the the more the, the moral I don't know is it too strong to say moral crisis of our of our current society? You think of how often well-meaning people make rational arguments in favor of moral positions and how those arguments, some, some of which I think are pretty good, some of them are not very good, but some of them are quite good, quite profound, and yet how thoroughly they can be ignored and rejected by those who don't already agree with those moral conclusions. And I think what I've offered here um, uh, provides some, some explanation for why that's true. 
for a moral argument to be really good, surely it's going to have to tap into this kind of social capital, this wisdom that the human race has already built up and discovered to some degree. I think just without getting deep into our the current moral debates and discussions and controversies about sex and marriage, I think so many of the better of the arguments uh, in terms of sex and marriage presume some sort of experience of, understanding of, or sympathy with sexual behavior that is actually profitable and fruitful. And for those whose only experience or only communal context for thinking about or experiencing sexual behavior is pleasure maximization, desire gratification, it's going to be very hard to appreciate the power of good arguments for healthy sexual relationships. Well, a second comment. I know that's I opened up a really big topic there, and I'm just going to go on. I would like to suggest that in for those of you especially who are students or professors uh, involved in academic disciplines, thank you. it's important that you understand, and I'm sure you already have a sense of this, that your academic disciplines involve a kind of enculturation into practices and into ways of seeing the world that can't be reduced to textbooks and to rational explanation and rational argument. You can't just master the textbooks on sale at the university bookstore in order to be a real master of any particular field of learning. You have to be absorbed into certain ways of thinking, into certain ways of looking at problems, into certain ways of collaborating with others. And it's, you're probably not going to become a master just by sitting at your desk at the library, but by having good mentors and good teachers who model that kind of way of seeing the world and of approaching problems in productive ways. And then finally, I would suggest that I, would, I want to challenge you, especially who are students, that you would understand your pursuit of academic learning, of these intellectual disciplines, that you would see that as part of your broader moral vocation. There is a kind of a wisdom that inheres in the mastery of intellectual disciplines. And we all know people who are very accomplished in academic disciplines or in other kinds of practical skills who are rotten people. But I want to encourage you that if you, if you are to be truly wise in your field of learning, it's not just a narrow mastery of a particular subject, but it's a kind of a mastery that is able to put your discipline in a broader context of how God has made the world and of what human societies are like and how they operate and how your ac academic discipline can be put to good use uh, to further this great moral vocation, which I refer to as the Royal Commission.